couldn't help um, uh, remember someone was talking about the adulation in which the world held uh, Alger Hiss. And I, I don't know if everyone here is aware that at an august educational institution, not too far from here, I mean uh, Bard College, uh, that there's actually an Alger Hiss chair in the <laughs> humanities. Um, uh, my colleague, uh, Hilton Kramer, uh, uh, the founding editor of the new Criterion, uh, had an honorary degree from Bard. When, when, this, uh, when this new chair in the humanities was announced, he promptly gave it back to, <laughs> to the president, Leon Botstein. Well, um, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome you to our final panel commemorating the 60th anniversary of Whitaker Chambers' Witness. Um, and I think we've saved the most difficult, or at least the most contentious question for last. What defines conservatives today? I think in the, in the context of Witness and the work of Bill Buckley, uh, today means after the Cold War. We've said a little bit about that already uh, um, this afternoon. Uh, but I'd like to say a little more about it, a little more specifically about it now. So after the Cold War, that means after the implacable confrontation of communism instantiated then by the evil empire of the Soviet Union and the West. In uh, his prefatory letter to his children, which has been mentioned already, uh, Chambers said that in communism he saw, quote, the concentrated evil of our time. Uh, Bill Buckley looked with kindred eyes upon the enormity of communism. Indeed, conservatives of all stripes could agree about the hi hideousness of the communist system, which is why the world of the Cold War was in many ways a, a tidier, more Manichaean world than the one that we inhabit. Whatever else it might be said about it, the Soviet Union provided a sort of negative rallying point, something that conservatives of all sorts could define themselves against. And I wonder about today. What, what, uh, what about today? What, what do, how do conservatives define themselves? Well, that's the question that I hope the panel is going to conjure with. Uh, and before I turn things over to them, I want to make just two briefly, two final points and one of which was uh, raised a couple times this afternoon. If conservatives were virtually at one in regarding the freedom-blighting ideology of communism with repugnance, they were not, I believe, quite so unified in understanding communism as did thinkers like Chambers and Buckley. Um, Chambers readily acknowledged the familiar immiserating features of communism, the gulag and so on. But, like Bill, he went further. Communism, he said, was a vision of man without God. And we've had that a couple of times today. And I want to emphasize that. That's the core of the phenomenon. It was an elaboration of the seductive promise, said Chambers, that was made in the Garden of Eden. Relinquish God and follow me, said the serpent, and ye shall be as gods. That was the hubristic existential catnip that fueled the deep appeal of communism. And it is, as Bill recognized, an appeal that survived the demise of the Soviet empire. You remember that in God and Man at Yale, one of the most famous lines there is that Bill said, I believe that the struggle between communism and atheism is the most important in the world. And then this uh, striking uh, codicil and that the struggle between individualism and collectivism is the same struggle on a, a different level. Now, exactly how conservatives have dealt and should deal with that survival, survival uh, is, is part of what we are charged with discussing uh, on this panel. How do conservatives understand themselves today absent that Manichaean, uh, that Manichaean threat? Now, the late Irving Kristol, a friend of many of us here, <coughs> summed up our situation with his customary insight and elegance when he said in an essay written 
shortly after the collapse of the Soviet Union that, and I'm quoting now, there is no after the Cold War for me. So far as having ended, my Cold War, said Crystal, has increased in intensity as sector after sector of American life has been ruthlessly corrupted by the liberal ethos. It is an ethos, he said, that aims simultaneously at political and social collectivism on the one hand and moral anarchy on the other. It cannot win, but it can make us all losers. Uh, to meditate on the meaning of this great contest, we've assembled a distinguished panel of Chambers' intellectual and moral heirs. Peter Berkowitz is the current Tad and Diane Taub Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, where he chairs the Hoover Task Force on National Security and Law and co-chairs the Hoover Task Force on the Virtues of a Free Society. In the past, he has served as an associate professor at George Mason University School of Law and an assistant and associate professor at Harvard University. He is the author of Virtue and the Making of Modern Liberalism and Nietzsche and the Ethics of an Immoralist. He holds a JD and a PhD in political science from uh, this institution, an MA in philosophy from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and a BA in English literature from Swarthmore College. Norman Pod Horitz, I, mean, I feel sort of silly introducing these people because everyone knows who they are, but still, I, I have to do this. Norman Pod Horitz served as the editor in chief of Commentary Magazine from 1960 to 1995 and is their current editor at large. He was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by George W. Bush. He served as a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and was a senior fellow. Uh, uh, and he's the author of many books and articles, including The Bush Doctrine, What the President Said and What It Means, World War IV, The Long Struggle Against Islamofascism, and Why Are Jews Liberals? Uh, which a reviewer for the New Criterion said should really have been titled why are Jews still liberals? <laughs> um, he was a Pulitzer Prize scholar at Columbia University where he earned his Bachelor of Arts in 1950. And he also holds a, a bachelor's and master's degrees from Cambridge University, uh, England, where he was a Fulbright scholar and a Kellett fellow. In addition, he has a bachelor's degree in Hebrew literature from the Jewish Theological Seminary. Al Regnery, Alfred Regnery, is the managing director of a new initiative called the Paul Revere Project, a new communications initiative, and is the chairman of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. He was for many years the distinguished publisher of the American Scholar. He, he uh, took a moribund uh, American magazine. American Spectator. American Spectator, sorry, the American Spectator. Um, uh, a once moribund uh, magazine that he breathed new life into. Uh, and he's the former president and publisher of Regnery Publishing, of course, which uh, originally published uh, Witness. Uh, Mr. Regnery served in the Department of Justice during the Reagan administration as Deputy Assistant Attorney General and as Administrator of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Uh, he's published many articles and his new book is Upstream, The Ascendance of American Conservatism, published in 2008. Now, Mr. Podhoritz is asked to speak first, so I'd like to offer him the floor. Norman Podhoritz. Thanks, Roger. Um, as, uh, as was mentioned, I made a vow never to set foot on a college campus again after uh, a number of nasty experiences uh, at a number of college campuses. And I now uh, understand why uh, the Day of Atonement begins uh, for Jews with the disavowal of vows that have been broken. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I was forced by these persuasive young people to uh, break a vow, and I will have to seek atonement in due course. <laughs> in any case, for, for a reason that, that uh, will become clear in a moment, it's from the perspective of neoconservatism that I want to talk about conservatism without anti-communism. Now, as one of its godfathers, along with Irving Kristol, I've been a neoconservative for so long that I should probably be called a paleo-neoconservative. <laughs> 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 
But as the prefix neo indicates, I and the other neoconservative intellectuals of the first generation were new to conservatism, having begun our political lives somewhere on the left. This then links us more closely to Whitaker Chambers than to Bill Buckley, who was, of course, to the manner born. But there was another and even stronger link to Whitaker Chambers in the force that drove most of us out of the left and into the right. That force was anti-communism. Now, to be sure, unlike Chambers, none of us had been a Stalinist, let alone a Soviet agent. A few had once been Trotskyists, a few had been liberals, and a few, myself for my sins included, had been associated with the new left. Nevertheless, we were all scarcely less passionate in our anti-communism than Chambers himself. We too saw communism as an absolute evil, fully comparable to Nazism, but even more dangerous because of its far greater appeal to many more people than Nazism had ever exerted. Accordingly, we felt and took upon ourselves a moral obligation to fight with all our intellectual might against communism and the world of ideas and against its metatastic spread through the military power of the Soviet Union, its main incarnation in the world at large. So far, so Chambers-like. But we parted <clears throat> company with Chambers when it came to the force, the only force capable of halting the spread of Soviet power and in this correlative way to help strangle the ideological cause served by that power. I'm going to quote again what's been quoted several times, uh, Chambers' famous remark to his wife about his break with communism. I know that I am leaving the winning side for the losing side, but it is better to die on the losing side than to live under communism. Now, I, for one, and most of my fellow neoconservatives agreed with the second half of that declaration, which amounted to a defiant repudiation of what came to be inelegantly known as anti-anti-communism, and whose identifying mark was the slogan, better red than dead. But we strongly rejected the idea that America represented the losing side in the struggle against Soviet expansionism and the communist plague that went with it. For the anti-communist passion we shared with Chambers was inseparable from a commensurately powerful love for and faith in the United States of America and the civilization for which it had gone to war against the two great carriers of modern totalitarianism, first Nazi Germany and now communist Russia. And unlike Chambers, we believed that the United States would eventually turn back the communist threat to Western civilization, just as surely as, as it had done to the equally evil threat posed by Nazi Germany. Not, mind you, that we underestimated the might of the Soviet military or the strength and resolve of the anti-anti-communist forces arrayed against us, both at home and abroad. In fact, there were times when we came close to fearing the Chambers and other conservative anti-communists like James Burnham, who wrote a book entitled Suicide of the West. We feared that they might be right. <clears throat>